Andante Cantabile, Fra Angelico's Celestial Concerts. Pope John Paul II, again speaking about Fra Angelico, said, with his whole life he sang the glory of God, which he carried like a treasure in the depths of his heart and expressed in his works of art. St. Albert the Great, great Dominican theologian, is well known for his commentary on musical practice in his times. And most of his written musical observations are found in his commentary on Aristotle's poetics. He rejected the idea of the music of the spheres as ridiculous. Movement of astronomic, astron, astron, astronomical bodies, he supposed, is incapable of generating sound. He wrote extensively on proportion in music and on the three different subjective levels on which plain chant could work on the human soul. Purging of the impure, illumination leading to contemplation, and nourishing perfection through contemplation. And of particular interest to 20th century music theorists is the attention he paid to silence as an integral part of music. I did a conference in um, 2016, I think it was, in San Marco in Florence, uh, entitled Sounds in the Silence. And, you know, Fra Angelico's work, his pictorial art, but also his musical art, were really born in the silence of his contemplation. And while that silence emanated through the cloisters of San Marco, certainly what resounded there was the beautiful singing of the, the Dominican chant that the friars, you know, seven times a day, they sang the Divine Office. And I'd like us just to, we're looking here at a depiction by Fra Angelico from an antiphonary, and it's a, a depiction of David and Solomon dancing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. David, of course, the author of the Psalms. And St. Thomas Aquinas says, you know, that all theology is contained in the Psalms. The friars would have known off by heart the Psalms. They knew the 150 Psalms by memory, and they were able to sing them. So they weren't using breviaries or iPads or iPhones as we use today. They had all the, the Psalms off, off by memory. And I'd like us to maybe just take a moment and look at the next slide and listen briefly to a lovely piece of music by a later composer, much later than Fra Angelico, Claudio Monteverdi, and it's a beautiful rendition of Psalm 112, Beatus Vir. We're not going to listen to all of this, it's very long, but just a section of it.
I just would like to make a reference to a term, uh, word painting. A term, a musical term, which was borrowed from pictorial art. But word painting in music refers to uh, embellishment of a, a particular note or a particular phrase in a piece of music. And it's how composers wanted to emphasize an event, an important moment in a piece of music. Um, the great Hildegard of Bingen was famous for, you know, 11th century woman, a Benedictine German, who was a great composer of music and known for her beautiful embellishments of her, her chants. And I think, you know, one that we would be all very familiar would be the word Alleluia, which we use so much during the Easter season and the various ways in which we can decorate and embellish that particular, that particular word in music. And that's important, I think, when we listen to a piece of music to just maybe pick out you know, aspects that the composer wants to, wants to specify or wants to, wants to highlight. I just also like to mention that uh, Fra Angelico's brother, Fra Benedetto, entered San Domenico di Fiesole along with him. And the chronicle of uh, San Domenico di Fiesole, you know, and the chronicle of San Marco talks about Fra Benedetto as, you know, a musician, as a cantor. And they collaborated together uh, a little bit on the musical books. I believe that Fra Benedetto would have, as a scriptor, as a writer, would have uh, written the musical notation in while his brother Angelico did the decoration of these wonderful pages. But I think you can imagine somebody who's writing, you know, musical notes. It, it's, it's in his head and as he's composing and he's humming these wonderful tunes. We're going to look and this um, portrayal by Fra Angenico, a portrayal of Saint Dominic in glory. And this is in a choral missal, a missal that was used in the choir, and uh, it was used in San Domenico di Fiesola. And this is probably one of Fra Angelico's monumental images. And primarily, the composition unveils. Angelico's skill as an illuminator, a talent which was recognized and supported by his Dominican superiors, who sub subsequently afforded the young friar the opportunity to initiate his unique pictorial preaching mission. And folio 67V of the manuscript depicts Saint Dominic in glory. And the text and the notation is of the introitus of the Mass for the Feast of the Saint, and is in Medio Ecclesia. And this is the antiphon that was used from the common of, of confessors, we'd say today the common of pastors. And it was the entrance antiphon for this feast. The manuscript, which was originally, as I said, illuminated for San Domenico di Fiesli, is preserved in the Museo di San Marco in Florence registered as Messale di San Domenico and listed as MS 558 in the museum's inventory. It is generally accepted that this is the first miniature attributed to Fra Angelico, an attribution which is confirmed by the editor of a fairly recently published facsimile of the manuscript. And it says, the very delicate parchment codex known as Messale San Domenico is the first work attributed to Beato Angelico, wherein his substantial autograph is commonly accepted. It seems very likely that with this specific image of Saint Dominic in glory, Fra Angelico introduced music iconography into his oeuvre. And we can safely propose that this image served as an overture to Angelico's later large-scale, what I term, musical paintings, or dipinti musicali. The source and the context for the specific music iconography, I believe, is certainly the text of the 
first stanza of the sequence for the Mass of the Feast of St. Dominic. In the heavenly hierarchy, let there sound a new harmony produced in a new canticle, and let the melody of our choir on this earth agree therewith, rejoicing with Dominic. In celesti hierarchia, nova sonnet harmonia, nova ducta cantico, cui concordet in hac via, nostri cori melodia con gaudens domenico. Accordingly, inspired by the opening lines of the sequence, Fra Angelico enclosed Dominic in a gold mandola and surrounded him with a celestial ensemble of eight angels. Aiuto. <laughs> okay, what is happening? I must have too much electricity in my body between the chocolate, the cafe con leche, and the cigarettes. It's okay. And that's an antiphon that we still sing in, in, in the order today. Now let's go back. Francesco, as I said, enclosed St. Dominic in a gold mandala and surrounded him with a celestial ensemble of eight angels.
this musical ensemble is clearly divided into two groups. The first group play musical instruments, the lute, the viol or the fiddle, the trumpet and the portative organ, while the second group is portrayed in a movement which seems to suggest singing in joyful exultation. Cantate et jubilate Deo. Highlighting the opening words of the sequence, Angelico visually portrays the sound of a new harmony, a sound which has produced a new canticle. And moreover, this image of St. Dominic in glory offer, offers the sons and daughters of the saint an audio-visual assurance that the founder of the Dominican order, now resplendent in glory, will fulfill his deathbed promise to be of more help to his brethren than if he were to remain on earth. Consequently, the earthly Dominican choir is invited to join with the heavenly choir, and therefore the time is now ripe, particularly for the friars of San Domenico di Fiesole, to join in singing the new canticle of Dominican observance and reform. There we can see the two groups of angels, the four on the top playing the musical instruments, while the four underneath are in this beautifully choreographed movement of joyful celebration. As a Dominican preacher grounded in the order's liturgical traditions, Fra Angelico composed his musical paintings with a particular audience and a specific context in mind. And his, in his letter to artists in 1999, Pope John Paul II under, endorsed the power of art to nourish the minds of both the viewer and the listener. And he said, Art has a unique capacity to take one or other facet of the message and translate it into colors, shapes, and sounds which nourish the intuition of those who look or listen. Accordingly, Angelico, the preacher, enhanced the color, the timbre of his audiovisual homilies by the infusion of colors, shapes, and sounds which were designed to nurture the minds of his viewers and listeners, principally the friars of San Domenico and subsequently San Marco, those who participated daily in the celebration of the Dominican liturgy. As Carl showed us yesterday, this is one of the paintings that Frangelico painted for the church of San Domenico di Fiesole. And this was in the part of the church outside of the friar's choir. It was uh, on one side, the Annunciation, which is at the Prado, was on the left-hand side as you enter the church, while this one was, was on the right. I think it seems most likely now that Guido di Piero entered the Dominican order in San Domenico di Fiesole in the 1420s. And we can attest with a high degree of probability that the young friar was authorized by his superiors to commence work on his iconographic program for San Domenico shortly after completing his novitiate. The Messala di San Domenico is dated between 1425 and 1430 and is therefore one of Fra Angelico's earliest works. 
The high altar piece for San Domenico di Fiesole was Fra Angelico's principal artwork for the church. However, the original triptych was completely altered in 1501 and consequently due to a paucity of descriptive evidence, we can only create a hypothetical reconstruction of the original altarpiece and we saw that, uh, Carl had that yesterday for us. The original predella panels were sold in the 19th century and are now preserved in the permanent collection of the National Gallery in London. They are here on display at the exhibition and we'll see those later. And I think it's interesting to note that the galleries, the National Gallery's conservation department undertook major restoration of the five panels in 1999. And preliminary conservation studies and close non-invasive examination of the paintings, including stereo microscope, X radiography, infrared photography, and particularly rect rectography, rect rectography imaging, reveals uh, Fra Angelico, an artist, his original sketches under the painting. And these are really standard procedures in the con conservation process. And when uh, restoration of uh, artworks is, is being undertaken. So having undertook the required pre-conservation examinations, the analytical report in the gallery's technical bulletin not only reveals Fra Angelico's supreme artistic technique, but also his early training as an illuminator of manuscripts. And I believe the findings are worth citing as they further confirm that on entering the Dominican order, Fra Angelico was already a skilled painter and illuminator. And they say, Fra Angelico's predella panels reflect traditional Florentine painting practice for the first decades of the 15th century and show many aspects of technique that were current 50 or 60 years earlier. They are unusual for their meticulous execution and remarkable for their brilliant colour and highly decorative detail, which reflects Fra Angelico's presumed early training as an illuminator of manuscripts. They are painted purely in egg tempera. This has been demonstrated by analysis. The only role of a drying oil, oil is in the mordants used to apply gold and silver leaf on the paint. In common with many paintings in tempera, in which final glazes in oil were not part of the technique, the paint layer structures are quite straightforward. The high key effects of using a simplified palette of strongly colored pigments, such as natural ultramarine, azurite, vermilion, pink colors made from red lax mixed with white, lead tin, yellow and lead white, against backgrounds of tooled gold leaf recall the brilliancy and luminosity of contemporary manuscript painting. The extensive and detailed use of mordant gilding, particularly in the decoration of draperies, reinforces the impression. Magnolia Scudieri, the former director of the Museum of San Marco, outlines the genesis of Fra Angelico's icon iconographic program at San Domenico di Fiesole. And she highlights a significant lacuna in the chronicle regarding Angelico's early works at San Domenico. There is no reference to any of the paintings executed by Fra Angelico prior to the entry on the consecration of the church, which took place on the last Sunday of October in 1435. The compilation of the original chronicle of San Domenico was initiated in 1516, some 60 years after Fra Angelico's death. So consequently, many details regarding the execution of his early iconographic program at San Domenico are not recorded in the chronicle. Frangelico's iconographic program for the Church of San Domenico di Fiesole included various depictions of musical instruments. 
Rhythm, harmony, color, and texture are key components in a musical composition. And accordingly, when these elements are applied to a parchment or a wall, a wood panel, or a canvas through the medium of painting, the result is that the visual incorporates the oral and consequently a symphony of sight and sound is born. This is another coronation of the Virgin, which we saw yesterday, which is in the Uffizi Gallery in, 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 in Florence. Um, again, depicting many, many musical instruments. This is the, as it is today, the main altarpiece for Fra San Domenico di Fiesole. It's now in a small chapel on the left-hand side as you enter the church. And this is the painting that was completely changed in 1501. Uh, it was originally a triptych, and Carl showed us yesterday the hypothetical reconstruction of what it originally was like. And the only, I suppose, um, the items that are remaining by the hand of Fra Angelico are the figures of the Madonna and child surrounded by the angels and the figures of the saints, the three principal Dominican saints, the saints who were officially canonized, Dominican saints who were officially canonized at Fra Angelico's time, the founder of the order, Saint Dominic, the first and great preacher and the first martyr of the order, Saint Peter of Verona, Saint Peter Martyr, and the great Dominican theologian, Saint Thomas Aquinas. There's an image there also of Saint Barnabas, Saint Barnabas, the apostle as he's known, a uh, contemporary of a great preacher who uh, preached along with Saint Paul. And Barnabas was the patron saint of Barnaba degli Alli, one of the uh, great patrons of particularly patrons for the work of painting and reconstruction at San Domenico di Fiesole. And that's just a close-up of the central panel. These are the predella panels which are conserved in the National Gallery in London, are in the exhibition, we'll see them this evening. You have the Dominican uh, Beati, not all officially beatified or canonized because as I said, the only three Dominican saints in the 1430s were Dominic, St. Peter Martyr, and St. Thomas Aquinas, but Fra Angelico uh, depicted this group of Beati. They were already, according to him, in paradise. They weren't officially canonized, canonized or beatified, but they were, they were in paradise. This is the central panel of um, the predella, Christ in glory. We looked at it a little bit yesterday. Christ in glory, surrounded by this army of uh, musical uh, instruments, angels making music singing and playing, um, glorifying Christ. <laughs>
We saw this uh, detail also yesterday. Eduardo looked at the plants. This is a uh, detail from Frangelico's Universal Judgment, and this is the Beati who are dancing. I added that wonderful piece of music by Christoph Gluck, the dance of the blessed from the opera uh, Orfeo. And Albert the Great described, you know, the, um, the spheres, the music from the spheres as a ridiculous, but uh, I think it fits in very well. And it was the music of the spheres was kind of used by many composers, you know, to depict celestial music or depict heavenly, heavenly music. And, you know, when we look at this and maybe reflecting on Eduardo's presentation yesterday evening, and you look at the beauty of the plants and the flowers, and the draperies, and listen to the music, and look visual at it. It's a, it, it, it's a completely encompassing, wonderful work of art that, that really touches us deep, deep down, you know. And if anybody feels like dancing later, feel free to sing or to dance. You know? <laughs> Dante, in Canto Tien, 10 of the Paradiso, refers to heavenly music as one of its gems. However, according to the poet, it is one which cannot be authentically interpreted. He says, in heaven's court, from which I have returned, one finds so many fair and precious gems that are not to be taken from that kingdom. One of those great gems, the song those splendors sang, he who does not take wings to reach the realm may wait for tidings of it from the mute. Nevertheless, I believe if we recall Michelangelo's reputed statement on seeing some of Fra Angelico's paintings in San Domenico di Fiesole, our painter went to heaven to consider the blessed faces of the saints and then returned to earth to paint them. We can safely propose that Frangelico was capable of portraying in a very realistic manner the splendor of heavenly music as performed by the celestial ensemble. Frangelico's technical excellence in the creation of his musical paintings reaches its peak, I believe, in the interpretations, his interpretations of the coronation of the Virgin. And it is worthy of note that famous musicologist Emmanuel Winternitz attributes the introduction of angel musicians in art to the influence of the writings of Fra Angelico's fellow Dominican, the 13th century bishop and author Jacopo de Voragine. He says, musical angels other than apocalyptical entered the scene with the spread of the Legenda Aurea, when legends of the saints and Marianic topics, especially the Assumption and Coronation, the themes most conducive to the betrayal of large angel orchestras prevail, and also appear later, chiefly in the Venetian realm, with the Sacre Conversazione and their small ensembles or singing angels playing the lute, the lira da braccio, and occasionally other instruments. Many of Fra Angelico's painted narratives are heavily dependent on the Legenda Aurea, with certain accounts being mirror images of De Voragine's narratives. The preaching artist's rhetoric remains a fascinating narrative, not only for art historians, but also for musicologists. Furthermore, Fra Angelico's musical paintings are significant sources for the study of music iconography. And I'd just like to read for you a section of a homily of St. Amadeus of Lausanne. And this is a homily that's read on the feast or the memory, the memorial of the Queenship of Mary. And it says, because of the honor due to her son, it was fitting indeed that the Virgin Mother should first rule upon earth 
and afterwards be received into the heavenly sanctuary in the fullness of holiness, transformed from brightness to brightness by the Lord who is spirit. Bride, gracious and most beautiful, so abundantly endowed, mother of the heavenly bridegroom, fountain of paradise, well of life-giving waters, flowing in torrents from the divine Lebanon, she pours down from the mountain of Zion on all the nations round about, rivers of peace and grace. When the Virgin of Virgins, of all virgins, was assumed into heaven by God, her Son, the King of Kings, to the accompaniment of this joyous exaltation of the angels, archangels and saints, the prophecy of the psalmist was fulfilled, in which he said to the Lord, At your right stands the Queen, clothed with splendor, in robes embroidered with pearls, set in gold. This is a, a reconstruction, again, hypothetical of San Domenico di Fiesole. And here we can see the church with its root screen, uh, the part that separated the friar's choir from the public part of the church. And here you can see those two paintings, the Annunciation, the Coronation of the Virgin, and inside in the choir with the main altarpiece. The conventual mass was, was celebrated uh, every day, and every friar had to participate at the conventual mass. There was no con-celebration at the time, so all of the community were present for the mass, and it was the the highlight of the day. <coughs> it's difficult to know how many public people came to San Domenico di Fiesole to worship in that church. It was very small. There were no buildings or palazzi as there are today. There were no villas at the time. I think the first villa that was built in that area was the Villa Medici, which today is a wonderful hotel. But uh, I, there were people who were, who were working around and working in the fields. They, they, the land that the Bishop of Fiesle donated to the Dominicans was part of the Bishop of Fiesle's vineyard. So, and he gave them this piece of land in order to, through John Dominici to construct this, this new locus, this new convent. But uh, we get an idea. And there would have been, at the entrance, there would have been two doors which were usually only opened when the host was elevated and the chalice elevated at the Mass. So when the priest lifted up the host and lifted up the chalice, the people, say, behind in the public area could see that. Th those doors were also opened in the evening for Compline, for the Office of Compline, particularly for the Salve Regina procession, the procession in honour in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, which took pla place after Compline, and the singing of the O Lumen, O Lumen Ecclesia, the hymn to Saint, Saint, Saint Dominic. And the friars would have processed out from the choir two by two, led by two acolytes holding candles, and out into the public church, and they would have first gone to the, um, probably the Annunciation, the, because the predella of that has scenes from the life of the Virgin, they would have sang the Salva Regina, but when they sang the O Lumen Ecclesia, they probably would have gone to this altar because the predella panels in the coronation of the Virgin depict scenes from the life of St. Dominic, the founder, particularly the miracles that were associated, by, uh, associated with St. With, with, with Dominic. Marilena showed us this image this morning, and these are these wonderful uh, small-scale tabernacles or reliquaries. They were painted by Fra Angelico, commissioned by Fra Giovanni Massi for Santa Maria Novella, and they contained, each of them, various relics of the saints. There were four of these that Fra Angelico painted. Uh, they were placed on 
probably on the high altar in Santa Maria Novella, particularly on, on major feasts. And these four tabernacles are all dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Of course, Santa Maria Novella, the church that's dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. And they are tiny paintings, but really marvelous technique. And you can see Fra Angelico, the miniaturist, how he was able to create such, you know, high level technical images in such a small space. Last year, these images came together. They, they were separated in the 19th century. Three of them still remain in the Museum of San Marco. And one of them is in Boston, in the United States, in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, uh, purchased in, in Florence in the 19th century. So last year, was it last year, was it two years ago? Last year, they were reunited in Boston. And I had the pleasure of going to to view them together. And they're absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Three of them are, 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 as I say, in San Marco. This particular one, it's an Annunciation in the top section and um, the Adoration of the, the Magi in the bottom. And then underneath are the, uh, various saints. Small. This is the second one. And this is, again, a coronation of the Virgin, a smaller, much smaller scale version of the one that was in San Domenico, but very, very similar to the one in San Domenico. And you have these line of beautiful angels dressed in blue at the bottom, you know, dancing and in beautiful, beautiful movement. You have uh, also angels playing various musical instruments. This one is known as the Madonna della Stella. Uh, an unusual image of the Blessed Virgin Mary standing and holding the infant in her arms, the infant Jesus, and surrounded by these little uh, areas which contained the relics of the various saints. There are 12 of these little areas have stars on them. And St. Dominic's favorite hymn, they tell us, was Ave Mary Stella. And he sang that when he was on a journey or when he was, you know, uh, going about in his preaching mission. He loved to sing. And this is really refers to the woman with the 12 stars, the woman of the Apocalypse, the woman that they talk about, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And again, surrounded this one by angels. And underneath that is the typical, the three saints of the time. You have St. Dominic at the center, St. Thomas Aquinas, and St. Peter Martyr. This is the one that's in Boston. And this is a beautiful dormition of the Virgin and the Assumption and Coronation of the Virgin. I'll just show you maybe a detail of that. And just to go back on the last section of that text from St. Amadeus of Lausanne, when the Virgin of all virgins was assumed into heaven by God, her son, the King of Kings, to the accompaniment of this joyous exalt exaltation of angels, archangels and saints, the prophecy of the psalmist was fulfilled in which he said to the Lord, at your right stands the queen clothed with splendor in robes embroidered with pearls set in gold. Here we have this wonderful uh, music making angels, dancing angels, there's music, there's choreography, there's jubilation, there's joy in heaven at the assumption of our Blessed Lady. Just some details of the musical angels playing there. The strings, the lutes, violin. And 
And we can clearly see, I think, you know, the beautiful textiles here painted that Roberto referred to, these beautiful designs in, you know, reproduced, embroidered on textiles, but reproduced in, in gold leaf. Fra Angelico's song, iconographic song of glory, is primarily, I believe, a visual canticle of praise to the beauty of God's creation. Angelico's song is enunciated iconographically in three specific narratives. The Universal Judgment, Enthroned Madonna and Child Paintings, and The Coronation of the Virgin. In the Oxford Companion to Music, Anne Buckley gives a comprehensive definition of music iconography, which is worth citing in full. Music iconography is concerned with the visual representation of musical topics. The primary materials studied include portraits of performers and composers, illustrations of instruments, and occasions of music making, and the use of musical imagery for the purposes of metaphorical or allegorical allusion. Iconography is thus an important source, resource for the study of music and the visual arts, including questions of patronage, reception history, social and intellectual history, philosophy and aesthetics, as well as more strictly technical matters such as organology, music theory, performance practice and contexts, and the study of artistic styles and symbolic meanings. Depictions of musical scenes may also include representations such as associated performances, performance arts such as dance and drama, as well as the kinds of space in which such activities took place. And Buckley highlights three principal contexts in which music as visual icon can be studied. Organology, the study of musical instruments, performance practice, and socio-cultural aspects, and symbolic uses of musical imagery. An examination of each particular context is important as it renders further insights into the events that influence the inclusion of musical instruments in painting narratives. Consequently, the design and construction and social function of musical instruments, as well as their use in contemporary performances and their symbolism in paintings, are the key components in which, which will lead to an informed musical iconographic interpretation of a visual musical artwork. The context can be summarized as follows. Organology, as I said, is the study of musical instruments in terms of their history and social function, design, construction, and relation to performance. Contemporary performance practice in the socio-cultural environment in which music flourished is a key factor in the study of music iconography and the symbolic use of musical imagery in painting. James McKinnon further contextualizes mu musical iconography within the discipline of art history in Music Iconography, a definition, and he highlights the Middle Ages and early Renaissance periods in the history of art as the most significant eras for the study of music iconography. He says the Middle Ages and early Renaissance are the most appropriate areas for the application of the iconographic method. Music iconography is the sub-discipline of art history which deals with the content of art and which rests upon the assumption that musical images in, in art, especially during the Middle Ages and Renaissance, are represented conventionally. Music was very much part of the culture in, in Florence. And in painting, we have the 
sacra conversazione, as we looked at the Annalena altarpiece. So this, you know, holy conversation between the saints surrounding the Madonna. They're not actually talking, they're usually looking out at us, you know, and there's a silence there. But there was also the sacra representazioni, which were musical uh, representation of stories and scenes from, from scriptures and from the Bible. And these were performances, musical performances in which groups uh, played musical instrument and interpreted it, you know, a bit like musicals as we'd know today. These normally didn't take place actually in the church, but they took place in a part near the church, maybe in the sacristy. So I think we can, you know, safely say that Fra Angelico was, was familiar with, you know, the musical instruments, contemporary musical instruments of the time. He certainly knew them. And as Carl, you know, told us yesterday morning, you know, he obviously didn't keep custody of the eyes, which was a, a grave sin. Uh, he was looking around and, you know, he was going on what Cinini, you know, stressed the emphasis it's important to draw from nature, you know, and draw. So look around at nature and draw a tree or draw a, a, a person or draw a flower or a musical instrument. And, you know, when we look at uh, Fra Angelico's depictions on his technique of these musical instruments, they're almost like photographic images of, of contemporary music, music instruments, you know. And what we need to do when we look at these musical paintings, we need to allow perhaps our mind and our ears to let us hear that particular music that's, that's in these paintings. Two wonderful musical uh, cantoria or choirs that were in the Duomo in Florence. Contemporary with one by Donatello and the other one by Della Robbia um, certainly would have influenced Fra Angelico as well in his depiction of uh, musical instruments. And this one here particularly um, narrates the last psalm in the book of Psalms, Psalm 150, which uh, calls on all of nature to praise God, but particularly to praise God with musical instruments. And there are ten altogether times to say praise him with this, and he mentions eight musical instruments. And this is the other one. Marilena showed us this morning this beautiful depiction of the Tabernacolo de Linaiuoli, the linen guild, uh, who commissioned in 1433 Fra Angelico to paint the Madonna enthroned. And the contract for that is still extant, and we still have it. Um, Ghiberti, uh, he designed the marble frame and uh, this beautiful tabernacle is encased in this. It's a large painting. I ha it was in restoration for, for many years, and all I saw for many years was just a, a, a picture of it at San Marco, and I never actually took note of the measurements. And when it came back, I, I, I just couldn't believe it. It, it, it was so big, it was, it, it, it was wonderful. But the Madonna here, surrounded by this, here's the picture of the Madonna and child. Roberta yesterday spoke to about the, the textiles, the beautiful gold and embroidery, and particularly it's a remarkable work. And when we all take up Marilena's invitation and we do a proper visita guidata di San Marco in October, when we go, we'll get to look at the, this wonderful uh, Linaioli Tabernacle in situ in, in, in San Marco. And these are the wonderful angels of Fra Angelico. The two at the top are praying angels. They don't have uh, musical instruments. So both of these angels have their hands joined in attitudes, in attitudes of prayer and underneath them are the various 
group of the music making angels. This is a close up of bees. One angel, if you notice, the hands joined. And the other one with their hands folded in prayer, two sort of prayer gestures. But gestures of praise. And when we look, if you could see maybe their faces, just take note of the joyful expression on their faces. The psalmist is here calling in the last, the ultimate psalm of the, the book of the psalms, he's calling on all of creation to, jub you know, to jubilate, to joyfully praise God. You have the angels in this way. There's the angel with the portative organ, the one on the left. The other angel is playing the trumpet. Frangelico had to see a performance of somebody playing a portrait of organ. Just look at the, the angel's hand. It's not very easy to actually say what note he's playing or to decipher what the angel is actually playing, but they are, again, I would say it's almost like a photograph of somebody playing a musical instrument. The angel blowing the trumpet is in the actual moment of blowing the trumpet. The tambourine. The one in the middle has another trumpet, but when we look at the close-up, that angel is not playing. And over is the other angel playing the violin, the strings. Sam tells them, Plays him, play, praise him with sound of trumpet. Praise him with strings and pipes. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with uh, the sound of cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. So it's all action there. The one in the middle, you can see, it's a touch it in the moment of the music when an instrument takes a pause and is not particularly playing. Tambourine. Clashing of symbols over on the right. She is the Tota Pulcra, portrayed by countless artists whom Dante contemplates among the splendors of paradise as beauty that was joy in the eyes of all the other saints. This is Pope John Paul II in his letter to artists talking about the beauty of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Tota Pulcra, total beauty. And this is a quotation from Pope Francis talking about the queen of all creation. It's from his encyclical Laudato Si. And he says, Mary, the mother who cared for Jesus, now cares with maternal affection and pain for this wounded world see that. Completely transfigured, she now lives with Jesus and all creatures singing of her fairness. Carried up to heaven, she is the mother and queen of all creation. In her glorified body, together with the risen Christ, part of creation has reached the fullness of its beauty. She treasures the entire life of Jesus in her heart and now understands the meaning of all things. 
Hence, we can ask her to enable us to look at this world with the eyes of wisdom. Eternal life will be a shared experience of awe in which each creature, resplendently transfigured, will take its rightful place and have something to give those poor men, men and women who will have been liberated once and for all. A beautiful um, quotation from, from Pope Francis on the beauty of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Let's listen to Nasani Regina Celi. This came at, at when the people on Easter Sunday morning in the opera, they entered into the church and it was Easter Sunday, that beautiful day, and they sang this wonderful place, hymn of praise to Our Lady Regina Celi.
And that, of course, is that marvellous, marvellous uh, uh, choral piece from uh, Massagne, from Cavaliere Rusticana, a wonderful, a wonderful opera, which, which really depicts, I think, what we have, we have been talking about. Blessed Jordan of Saxony, the immediate successor uh, of St. Dominic, gives us an insight into the personality, into the persona of St. Dominic. And since the foundation of the Dominican order, the solemn celebration of the liturgy has played a prominent role in the daily life of its members. And this commitment to the celebration of the liturgy is confirmed in the constitutions of the order. And in the section on sacred liturgy, the constitution state, it is the express wish of Saint Dominic that the solemn celebration of the liturgy in common be accepted as one of the principal duties of our vocation. That's the constitutions today. The initial institutions, as stipulated by St. Dominic, were established at the second general chapter of the order in 1221, the year in which Dominic died. Dominic wished the friars to be faithful to the divine office, both inside the convent and during the times when they were traveling on a preaching mission. Dominic's biographers all highlight the founders profound devotion and dedication to the liturgy and particularly to his love of singing. And William Bonnewell accounts in his History of the Dominican Liturgy, he says, even when he exchanged the quiet life of the cloister for that of apostolic journeys, he endeavoured every day when possible to celebrate a solemn or high mass in preference to a low mass. And so great was his devotion while officiating at the altar that tears coursed down his cheeks. Thoroughly permeated with the liturgical spirit, he would often, even while traveling, burst into song, singing with his whole heart the liturgical hymns of the divine office. Jordan, Jordan again, of Saxony recounts that notwithstanding the threats to Dominic's life, he still remained steadfast in his faith and continued to sing his song to God. And he says, on another occasion, when he was passing by a place where he suspected that perhaps they were lying in wait for him, he went on his way singing cheerfully. For his part, Brother Dominic, with all his energy and with passionate zeal, set himself to win all the souls he could for Christ. His heart was full of an extraordinary, almost incredible yearning for the salvation of everyone. As a member of the Dominican Reform and Observant Movement, Fra Giovanni Angelico endorsed Dominic's song, a specific Dominican melody, which must, I believe, resound in the hearts and on the lips of all of Dominic's family. The musical, this musical analogy was further promoted again by the great Edward Skillibex. And according to Skillibex, the advancement of a Dominican spirituality will be realized only in a completely new rendering of an old Dominican melody. He says, spirituality is not spirituality so long as it is only described, whether in an assertive or in an authoritarian tone. It is spirituality to the degree that is realized in practice as a completely new rendering of an old Dominican melody. The fundamental constitution of the Dominican order highlights the elements that define Dominican life and underscores the fundamental role of the liturgy in the life of each friar. And it says, sharing the apostles' mission, we also follow their way of life in the form devised by Saint Dominic. We do our best to live of one, accor of one accord the common life, observing faithfully the celebration of the liturgy, especially the Eucharist, and the divine office, 
diligent in study and constant in regular observance. Just to conclude now, in 1955, we referred to it yesterday, Pope Pius XII highlighted the paintings executed by Fra Angelico on the theme of the coronation of the Virgin. And in his, in his address at the opening of that exhibition, he, the Pope recorded a visit he had made 15 years earlier to the Church of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, where the mortal remains of Fra Angelico, as he said, are devotedly preserved. And he particularly recalled Angelico, as he said, the ecstatic artist of Mary, Queen of Heaven, who reminds us of the extraordinary favours bestowed on our smallness by divine providence. He said, to honour the Mother of God in singular guises, among which is to crown by hand our image of the Virgin, as he succeeded in doing many times in ecstasy of art, in masterpieces which have remained through the centuries types of heavenly beauty. I have a little surprise, I think. I'm going to put our Dominican brothers, some of them, under pressure. They don't know about this. We're looking at this image here, which is in the exhibition we will see this evening, and it's the image of the Salve procession and a particular event when Our Lady appeared to the friars and was blessing the friars. So I'm going to call on Dominican brothers and sisters to maybe join me here. And will we sing the Salve Regina? Please do. Please join me. <laughs> 